o'clock news starts right now and first at six a murder case turned mistrial now the two sides back in court today one side actually presenting new evidence. This is the case of R.C. Curtis, a man accused of killing his wife's grandmother, Paula Boyd, back in 2015. Last month, his case was declared a mistrial after the state presented two DVDs as evidence. The defense argued that it showed the possibility that more suspects could be involved in this case, which could have exonerated Curtis. During today's virtual hearing, the state submitted new blood evidence from the medical examiner. The judge now wants that evidence to the defense rather to also have access to that evidence. All of the information that they need, all of the information in this case, so that Mr. Curtis can have a fair trial, so that the state can have a fair trial, so that the defense can have a fair trial. That's all this is about. Yeah, that was Judge Stephanie Boyd talking. Now, she made it clear the state must submit all evidence currently available by Monday. Judge Boyd will decide whether the case will be dismissed or retried after that. What is the best way to spend $199 million? That's what the city of San Antonio is trying to figure out now as it works on allocating the rest of the federal money from the American Rescue Plan Act. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger covering the latest on this today. So Garrett, where are they in this process? Well, the city held community town halls, meetings with a small business advisory commission, and surveys trying to figure out how you want to spend the money. And they presented the results of that today. Now, issues like mental health, infrastructure, and housing featured strongly among community priorities, while small businesses from the commission had said they wanted things like loans and job training. The city has already spent money plugging budget holes from revenue shortfalls and helping people who are behind on their power and water bills. So city staff recommending setting some of the remaining funds aside for future COVID costs and putting more towards long-term investments. We heard some consensus in terms of the framework. Uh, I think they want to see specific recommendations on the buckets, how we can use those dollars. Uh, mental health, I think, was the area where we spent a lot of time today talking about a model that is that works for our community, as well as premium pay. Premium pay or extra money for people on the front lines of the pandemic was a popular discussion item. Several council members made it clear they support some bonuses for city employees. Though some wanted an option that would pay different amounts for those who had to come into work in person and those who were able to do things remotely. Now the council will approve a final framework in February. Then they'll start getting into the details of how to spend the money on specific programs. Live in the newsroom, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. A Bear County deputy without a job tonight, according to records obtained by KSAT 12. Those records say former deputy Maverick Moreland received his termination notice in September. Moreland arrested on suspicion of family violence back in January after a disturbance reported at a Northside bar. According to court records, the assault family violence charge was dismissed due to insufficient evidence. Those records state Moreland was accused of assaulting bar staff and causing damage to the property. In his termination notice, the Bear County Sheriff's Office says Moreland, quote, used poor judgment, end quote. A seventh grader now facing a serious charge. The Northeast Independent School District confirming that they were made aware of a threat yesterday. In a letter sent home to parents, the school's principal says a student made a threat online. Officials identified that student as someone from Kruger Middle School. NEISD says after an investigation, that threat was determined to not be credible. It still means trouble for the student, though. According to the district, that student now facing a felony charge of making a terroristic threat. A man arrested after allegedly causing destruction and more. He apparently stripped nude at a bar as well. This happening around 2.30 this morning at McFinnigan's Pub on Blanco Road near Castle Hills. Castle Hills police say the man was upset for not being served alcohol after the cutoff time. The bar owner says the man was also angry about a language barrier. Authorities believe the man may have been on drugs and is undergoing medical evaluation. Charges are pending. San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers asking for your help identifying the person that you see here. This person is accused of stealing from a Walmart near Loop 1604 and Calabra on the west side. Officers say this person grabbed items from the electronics department left without paying. Someone tried to stop the man. That's when police say the suspect threatened to stab that person. If you can help with this case, call Crime Stoppers 210-224-STOP. 
A new at six one day after KSAT reported on a budget deficit at Texas A&M San Antonio. News that the school's provost is stepping down immediately. The university president announcing Michael O'Brien's resignation in an email today. That email says O'Brien will remain at the school as a faculty member following a brief sabbatical. The announcement coming at the bottom of an email addressing media reports, including ours, about the budget deficit and enrollment at the university. In that message, the university president did not make a clear connection between the reports and O'Brien's resignation. But the provost's comments in November about a $4 million budget shortfall were part of our reporting yesterday at 6 o'clock. Others in the administration have told us the school's financial situation is strong, despite what the provost said. Efforts to reach the former provost directly were unsuccessful. National HIV and AIDS Awareness Month, a stark reminder of a virus that's killed millions. Even now, Metro Health reports at least one new case every day. Nationally, Metro Health's medical director says the number of new cases has been dropping. In San Antonio, the number's staying about the same, but it's expected they might increase once the COVID data is factored in. Jesse DeGoyado tells us what hasn't changed since HIV and AIDS became a source of worldwide concern. Greg Casillas not only works with homeless LGBTQ youth at Haven for Hope, being HIV positive for more than 20 years, Casillas says he's fighting the hurtful stigma those like himself often feel. We're 30 years into this chronic illness and we still have these things. We have to speak up. When they know us, they cannot deny us. Metro Health Medical Director Dr. Jenda Wu says although science has come a long way. What has not changed enough is people's attitudes. They say the stigma that persists even after all these years is keeping people from even wanting to know their HIV status. It's the stigma itself is hurting people. Wu says they may not know about the pills when taken once a day are safe and 99% effective in preventing HIV. Also, if you have HIV, you can have sex without transmitting HIV because the medicines these days are so powerful. I wake up, I brush my teeth, I take my pill, and that's it. Um, my diagnosis doesn't define who I am. Allowing people like Casillas to live out their lives, which was unheard of early on. You take a pill every day. HIV is a chronic disease like high blood pressure, like diabetes. Don't think about it as a death sentence if you are diagnosed with HIV because there is medication that will help you. But they say the first step is getting tested. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Cancer. It's a heavy word, and if you've been diagnosed with it or know someone who has, you understand that it's overwhelming. There is so much to figure out. Tonight, we're trying to help. Our Stephania Jimenez spoke with a breast cancer survivor and a surgeon who have advice for breast cancer patients. Kind of time stopped, the world stopped. It's a feeling Stacey Tinyanov can't forget. Back in 2013, her mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and while taking care of her, Stacy received her own diagnosis. When they did the mastectomy, I actually had two invasive tumors. So um, it was classified as a stage 1B. After her experience, she learned it was important to ask doctors lots of questions. And I think the most important piece for somebody who is newly diagnosed is not what targeted therapy can I have? It is how can I get the best diagnostic testing to see whether or not there's a target that can play a role in my cancer treatment. Everyone's diagnosis is different. The severity of the cancer determines the type of treatment. Some people require chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, oral medication, or a combination of some. Are you getting advice from more than one person? It's an important question Dr. Alistair Thompson says patients should ask. He's a breast surgeon at the Baylor College of Medicine, and he says treatments aren't what they used to be. So because of the advances in, in drug treatments, particularly, what we're trying to do is shrink down the cancer first, and that can mean we do smaller operations on the breast and actually smaller operations in the axilla or armpit, and therefore we have less impact uh, less cosmetic effect often um, on the breast and the chest wall. Now in remission, Stacy dedicates her time to helping patients navigate their cancer journey. It's a mission she hopes to continue for as long as possible. Stefania Jimenez, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam right now. 72 degrees, warm and sticky out there today, Adam. 
Yeah, that humidity, it's definitely noticeable. It's back, especially if you exercise outdoors. You notice these fluctuations uh, very acutely. 72 degrees right now at the dew point is 65. A calm breeze, and you take a look at readings locally, and for the most part, we're in the 70s. 69, though, measured at Randolph Air Force Base. 72 at the airport in town. Meanwhile, Stinson on the south side, 75. 75 in Divine and 68 in Bernie. This evening, though, not a big temperature drop. We'll get down into the mid-60s at midnight and pretty much stay there. So we are not looking at a fall-like cool night. It's actually going to be a little spring-like with humidity, which will lead to more fog. We're going to talk about that along with our temperature roller coaster with the next cold front coming up, Myra. All right, thanks, Adam. A Medina County girl not letting her health obstacles stop her from giving back to other kids this Christmas. She's a sixth grader, Mackenzie Hennessy. She battles a chronic inflammatory bowel disease known as Crohn's disease. A COVID paused her plans to give Christmas gifts to Methodist Children's Hospital last year. Well, this year she was able to do just that. Our Jaffney Gray shares how and why. I just feel like we need to make a difference. This 11-year-old Divine Middle School student is Mackenzie Hennessy. Her grandmother, Kathy Hennessy, says she has a heart of gold. It's always about how can I help somebody else? What can I do to brighten their life? At age six, Mackenzie was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at the Methodist Children's Hospital. I feel the pain and then I can't, like, stop it. I just have to keep going. And they don't see that because she never lets them see that. Instead, she lets the world see her strength and passion for giving. That's the words that she used. It's weighing heavy on my heart. I have to do something. So I called them. They said you can do something. So and I practically almost broke the window. So she was so excited. She reached out to her school counselor and together they took to Facebook for help. Hi. I am Mackenzie Hennessy and I am 11 years old. Seven hundred dollars later, she bought 120. How much? 120. Whoa. 120 gifts for 120 pediatric beds at the same hospital that's helped her through her battle. Because of COVID, Mackenzie is making the exchange at a drop off location here at the hospital. She says even though she won't be able to see the children's smiling little faces when they open their gifts, she wants them to know that they are special. They should be joyful and happy. Is that something that you've experienced in your lifetime where you've gotten a present and it made you feel? When our dad and mom divorced, the, um, the police station gave us some. Seeing her get to do the stuff that makes her heart happy makes my heart happy. I'm glad I'm able to do it. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Welcome back. Now, here's a peek at what you'll see tonight on the night beat. Threats of violence on school campuses. It has parents and students worried, and those threats have increased over the years. Tonight, we're going to talk about how a police department from a local school district investigates those threats and the consequences students face if they make them. Also caught on camera, a group of criminals breaking into cars in a north side neighborhood. The message from investigators and the one mistake that makes you vulnerable. Also, a Bernie family celebrating a festive win. Look at that. Tonight, we're going to introduce you to the winners of the Great Christmas Light Fight. Those stories and so much more tonight on The Night Beat. Didn't look like Adam Kasky's house. <laughs> That one he judged? I don't know. Maybe. All right. Know. We've been talking about how more people probably getting out and about after work, doing some shopping, leading to some crowded roads out there. Yeah, our Samuel King joins us now with the very latest. Sam? Uh, Steve Meyer, not a good time to be heading to uh, North Star Mall. This is uh, Loop 410 at McCullough Westbound. There's a crash uh, there, and that's causing some uh, major delays. Look, they're moving the camera just to show you that stop traffic and uh, delays there. Let's give you another view while they're adjusting that. Uh, this is a view from 281 and Loop 410, so you can see uh, definitely the delays out there this evening. So 10 minutes if you're heading from 281 to I-10, 12 minutes uh, heading eastbound, so definitely both above normal there. Looking at the uh, rest of the area, uh, had a crash there in the southeast side. I believe that is clearing, but we're also seeing some delays in 281. And on I-10 inside 1604, there's 26 uh, minutes now from 1604 to downtown, especially some delays once you get past Hildebrand. Only 12 minutes going in the other direction. Again, this is uh, Loop 410 here, uh, 281. We'll go back to that McCullough view just to show you uh, that crash there. So uh, definitely some busy uh, travel this evening, people getting out and about. So pack your patience if you have to head out in the next half hour or so, guys.
Yeah, tis the season for 410 and 281 to be worse than usual. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Meanwhile, I think this is uh, Incarnate Word. I think this is University of the Incarnate oh, Word. Yeah, the the lights. lights there along Light the Way. I know. And, you know, I, I said. That didn't look like Adam Kasky's house. I probably should have known better because I don't know that he's even got all his lights up yet. Uh -oh. I'm still working on it. See? Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got a few thousand up. I need to a little bit more. Just got to fill in some blanks. You have like a, a quota? Thousand. Of course. Like how many quota, lights have just, to be up? You can never have too many. My mother-in-law okay, commented, Clark. oh, wow. I mean, those are really tight. Clark. on the, Those are tight on the tree. Those are tight. I go, yeah, and every bulb is facing out. None of them are covered by the wow. wire. Wow. Hmm. Mm. This makes all the sense. Well, there's, so that's why it's taking you so long. Yep. If you're going to do it, might as well do it right. Okay. I get distracted right. too. You know that. I get distracted. Right. You? you else you're lights. No way. Something else comes up. I might as well tinker with this for a little bit and then, oh, I'm supposed to have those lights up. Mm -hmm. Got to work on it. Anyway, another warm and humid day tomorrow. Windy and cooler Saturday and the coldest temperatures yet coming Sunday morning across our area. So get ready for this. Let's start with a look at our high temperatures across the state. 85 in Junction. 89 Laredo for the high temperature, Victoria 84, Corpus Christi 86, even Abilene 83. In San Antonio, measured at the airport, 78 degrees, but on the south side, we made it into the 80s. It's just the low clouds from the fog were really stubborn. The fog lifted, held tight for a few hours, and then finally dissipated and got out of here into the afternoon. So the lack of even just a few hours of sunshine limited us from making it into the lower 80s here in town. And tomorrow I do think will be just a few degrees warmer. But outside right now, still 80 in Pleasanton, Catula's 83. Meanwhile, 71 in New Braunfels, Kerrville, and Fredericksburg. Morning low temperatures are going to take a big hit this weekend. Now tomorrow morning, mild, mid 60s. Actually, our morning temperature will be close to our average afternoon high. But then the cold air moves in and Sunday morning, that's our low point. We're expecting mid 30s in and around San Antonio. So some locations, especially outlying areas, could very well have their first freeze. I know we've already had a freeze in the hill country, but not elsewhere. Sunday, we have the potential for that. Of course, we'll be keeping a close eye on it and keeping you updated in the days ahead and what we're exactly expecting and where. Dew points are up. 60s, well into the 60s. It is sticky and muggy outside. That's going to lead to more fog tomorrow morning. Here's our future cast for visibility. This is at 5 a.m. Widespread areas of fog, reduced visibility, probably under a mile. And I think at times we could have visibility under a quarter of a mile. So it wouldn't surprise me if we have more dense fog and even a dense fog advisory to start the day for the morning commute. But once we get late in the morning and especially toward the noon hour, that should lift and dissipate and we'll have a little bit of sunshine. And by the way, dew points will drop off for the weekend and you won't even notice any mugginess. It'll be brief though. Here's the big picture. Good moisture across the western U.S. This system starting to come together. Uh, upper level disturbance picking up another one. They're going to move through Texas, but only clip us and really help the cold front move through town in the pre-dawn hours on Saturday. But unfortunately, not supply some much needed moisture. Friday night into early Saturday morning, we're talking a 10% chance. Then Tuesday and Wednesday, we're looking at a 20% chance. It'll be damp tomorrow morning with the drizzle and fog, but no real rain, not the good moisture that we need. And overall, the pattern's looking dry for the next week or so with no substantial good soaking meaningful rain. 64 in the morning, but by the noon hour, mid 70s, about 82 degrees, the high temperature in and around San Antonio, but a little closer to 90 when you get along the Rio Grande. Even Beeville, 84, 86, the high in Carrizo Springs. Timberwood Park, 81, but then Elmendorf in Von Army, 86 for afternoon highs. But this weekend, look at that change. Saturday, right near 60 degrees, pretty much all day long with the gusty winds up to 40 miles per hour. So gusty, cooler, but we'll have some sunshine on Saturday by Sunday. That chilly morning in the 30s will turn into a decent afternoon of about 63 and sunny. And then the humidity, morning fog and drizzle and warmer temperatures return pretty quickly into next week. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, I think the Spurs Coyote needs to dust off the Batman costume tonight <laughs> because uh, the Joker is at the AT&T Center tonight. Yes, Nikola Jokic of the Denver Nuggets. He's averaging a double-double this season when it comes to points and rebounds. Last night, he had a 39-point triple-double. The Spurs know they must slow down the defending MVP. And Dallas Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy made a bold statement when it comes to his team facing the Washington football team coming up.
win this game. Um, I'm confident in that. You heard it. Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy says they will beat Washington in big board sports. Two struggling teams will face off tonight when the Spurs host the Nuggets. The Spurs have lost two straight and six of their last 10, while Denver comes to town three and seven in their last 10 games. Kelvin Johnson is out tonight with a right ankle sprain, and Devin Vassell was upgraded to probable with a right quad contusion. Now Denver is also dealing with injuries, but big man Nikola Jokic is not among those injured players. He's the league's reigning MVP, and he's averaging a double-double this season at 26.3 points and 13.4 rebounds per game. Plus, he's dishing out seven assists per contest man he's tough to defend he almost took my head off in Denver um, so I just gotta keep your head on the silver try to be active um, try to make it as difficult as it is for him um, he's a special talent and uh, we got to help Yach and our bigs as much as we can and they play well off of him I mean the wings and the guards cut hard because um, they know he's gonna give it to him if they're open so um, they do a good job of spacing cutting and um, so it's going to be a tough task for us, and I mean, he's ahead of the snake, obviously. Denver flew in from New Orleans last night after they beat the Pelicans in overtime, 120 to 114. Jokic led the Nuggets with a season high 39 points to go with 11 rebounds and 11 assists. Spurs will host the Nuggets tonight, 7:30 at the AT&T Center. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Head coach Mike McCarthy is back with the Dallas Cowboys after missing the past 10 days due to COVID-19 protocols. You know he'd much rather coach face-to-face -face and not through a computer. He says December football defines your season, and so far they're off to a great start after beating the Saints 27-17 to open the month. He also says they will beat Washington. He's confident in that. Now, when it comes to bulletin board material, McCarthy says he doesn't spend any time on it because it's a waste of time. So he's not worried after saying that they will win this game. What am I supposed to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, we fully, I fully expect to win every game I've ever competed in. I mean, that's, that's what sports is all about. That's what the NFL, I, I trust me, I understand how hard it is. Um, they're working hard, we're working hard, but yeah, we, we, we're clearly planning on going to, you know, to Washington to win the game. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that. Coach confirmed that running back Tony Pollard suffered a foot sprain on that 58-yard touchdown run versus the Saints one week ago today. He says the plan is to get Tony through this week with the projection to play on Sunday at Washington. Linebacker Zach Cunningham has gone from last place to first place in the AFC South. Waved by the Houston Texans yesterday, Cunningham was claimed by the Tennessee Titans today. Here's three Texans on his release. I don't want to comment too much on it. You know, that's the coach's decision and uh, you know, he felt like that was best for the team, I guess. As far as just what I think, I just I keep that just to the self and to the team and our messaging. Um, it's just internal, and uh, that's the way that I'll, I'll keep. I mean, if there's a message, I mean, obviously, I didn't think there was a message. I mean, if you're not handling your stuff or whatever to a certain standard, then boom, that's, that's, that's what goes on. So, I mean, if you take care of business, you shouldn't have nothing to worry about. Houston will host Tennessee in Week 18, the final week of the regular season. Interesting. Yep, mm, you're going to see yeah. Zach very soon. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Our KSAP Q&A up next. From the very latest on Omicron to expanded eligibility for booster shots at home testing, let's talk COVID-19 with Dr. Ruth Bergren, infectious disease specialist at the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Good to see you, doctor. Last time you were here, we know that there was a lot of uncertainty about Omicron. There's been lots of reports saying perhaps more transmissible. What do we know at this stage? Yeah, we continually get the same consistent reports of increased infectiousness, um, several times more infectious than Delta. And generally speaking, we continue to hear that when people get Omicron, especially if they're vaccinated, that it seems to be a milder version of disease. It does not seem to be more severe. It does seem to be more infectious. And an interesting tidbit that was on the news wires today in the medical newspapers is that um, people are theorizing that the Omicron variant has picked up a snippet of material from the common cold. And um, perhaps that's what's helping it have its advantage in being more infectious, just and, like common colds are so infectious. And when we say more infectious, are we comparing it to Delta, the Delta version of COVID-19? Right, just more people per, per person infected, more other people, secondary cases are happening. How confident are you in the early findings right now that it is less severe? I mean, is there still some question out there about that? Well, I think we need more time to really study it. Uh, the reason people are hesitating is that 
the most reports are coming from where it was first discovered, right, which is South Africa. That's a demographically very different population than we have here in the United States, and it's a very under-vaccinated population. So drawing a lot of conclusions about what Omicron would look like in terms of severity here is not a, a wise thing to do. Um, we need to see what it, what it actually does do when you get into the United States or countries that are like the United States demographically as well as uh, with the um, number of people, percent of people vaccinated. Speaking of vaccines, the FDA green lighting today, booster shots for people as young as 16 for the Pfizer uh, booster. Your reaction to that? I think that's really welcome news. Uh, we know that boosters raise antibody levels. We know that with time, antibody levels begin to decline and we start to see breakthroughs. So getting this done, this authorization in advance of the Omicron variant really hitting the United States is a whole lot of common sense and it will prevent cases and it will prevent serious illnesses. I, I want to remind everybody that people are still dying of COVID-19 in this country. Um, we are seeing um, many cases in children uh, for 17 weeks in a row. Uh, we've had more than 100,000 cases per week in kids. So when you talk about lowering the boosting age from 18 to 16, it's a good step, but we really wanna focus on getting everybody fully vaccinated down to the five-year-olds. I want to talk about the home COVID tests. Uh, there have been a lot of advertising, a lot of people advertising them as good tools to use before you go somewhere for the holiday. What should you look for when you go to the pharmacy or the grocery store when it comes to some of these home COVID tests? Right, well, I think it's always wise to make sure that whatever you're picking up, um, what, whatever it may say on the label, why don't you verify online that that is one of the emergency use authorized home tests. And there are at least three or four of them right now. Nobody's done any super careful head-to-head -head studies about which one is better than the other. And frankly, um, there, there hasn't necessarily been a whole lot of choice uh, when you go to the store. So getting a recognizable brand that um, is well known to be EUA authorized, such as the Binax Now made by Abbott, just to name one example, um, just make sure that what you're buying is on the list of emergency use authorized tests. Realize that you can have false positives and false negatives, but it's much more likely to have a false negative than a false positive. That means that if you get a positive test, you should believe it and you should quarantine yourself. And you may also get a PCR test, a molecular test as a follow-up to confirm it, but you should behave from the moment you see a positive home test as if you really have COVID. So if it is a higher chance of you getting a false negative, if you've got symptoms, let's say, but you still get a negative test result, what do you do then? If you have symptoms that are typical for COVID, um, especially if you've got uh, loss of your sense of smell or taste uh, together with the body aches and all those symptoms that have been described so well, you should continue to quarantine even though you have a negative home test. And that would be a reason to go and seek a PCR test, which you can get at many locations throughout the city. And uh, just a, a good measure of common sense um, to, to keep yourself away from others. Don't go to work. Don't go to the grocery store. Uh, stay home until you're feeling better and try to get con confirmation from another test. You know, our, our local rate has gone from low to, to mild uh, as far as the risk level for, for COVID. Are you concerned about the holidays that we're going to see a spike post holidays because of people who haven't got the vaccine yet? Absolutely. Uh, and in, you're, you're exactly right that uh, any spike that we will see will be in the unvaccinated population. And so um, please go out and get vaccinated. All right, Dr. Ruth Bergeron, always appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being here. Happy. We'll be right back. The Spurs taking on the Nuggets tonight, AT&T Center. We'll have a preview coming up. It's been three days now since the dreaded mountain cedar season began here. So now you know why you've got a stuffy nose, headache, cough. Long term, these are just symptoms 
of chronic sinusitis. Allergy shots and medications may work for some people, but for others, even surgery may not work. Ursula Perry now with a newly FDA approved tool that's reducing the need for multiple surgeries. All right, obviously that was not the right video. No, that's the Cowboys. We've got our sports on our mind not at 630 apparently, <laughs> or somebody does. All right, it's 70 degrees outside right now. Another warm spring-like day in We're South all over Texas. the place. Yeah, we sure are. Up and down temperatures, and last night the fog developed pretty quickly, and I anticipate another round of fog to develop later on tonight and affect the morning commute tomorrow. Right now we're at 72. And by 8 o'clock will be a few degrees cooler. By midnight in the mid-60s, and I think we'll pretty much stay in the mid-60s through the rest of the night and all the way into tomorrow morning. Anticipate the fog, a little bit of drizzle, so some dampness to start the day, but not the real precipitation we need. The newest drought monitor is in. We'll take a look at that for the whole state and our area, along with our rain chances with the next cold front coming up. I want to apologize for the technical difficulties. Now I think we have that story on a new tool to battle chronic sinusitis. Ursula Perry with the details. Alexa, please play some music from the 70s. Carol Temkin is all about music family and her dog Tucker. But her chronic sinus issues made these moments tough to enjoy. I would just have times where I was just couldn't breathe and it was very hard to just live everyday life. Timken tried allergy shots, over-the-counter medication, nasal sprays, and even antibiotics. So pretty much I was doing everything that I could do to make it better, but it wasn't getting better. Ear, nose, day. and throat doctor Ryan Vaughn believed surgery not, could be an option for Timken. However, due to scarring... The likelihood of needing to do surgery again can be as high as 50 to 60 percent, depending on the patient's conditions. But an innovative FDA-approved stent is reducing the need for revision surgery. The Propel stent is able to be placed after the sinus has been opened, and what it does is actually sits inside that opening, putting pressure outward in a gentle fashion and also releasing an anti-inflammatory medication. Preventing the sinus from scarring, meaning more surgery later on was unnecessary. Temkin had the surgery and had the Propel stent added in and is feeling much better now. As my husband says, you're not snoring. You know, I, I can breathe through my nose. So it's pretty amazing. Once the surgery is performed and the Propel stent is put in place, patients tend to see some results within just a few days. That stent will stay inside the sinus cavity for about 45 days and then it just dissolves on its own. While it won't cure your cedar fever, it can at least help some of the symptoms. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's turn to the weather now where the temperatures keeping us on our toes. Yeah, week. definitely. It, it is, and you know, relating to Ursula's story there, the wind is going to shift northerly this weekend, and that should increase the cedar count a little bit because we have our first little hints of it in the air, yeah. but that north wind usually boosts the cedar count. That sounded like good news. I, I know, you, you delivered up like, oh, and oh. just. Oh, us back yeah. Down. Yeah. I like to keep you on your toes. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. You're welcome. <laughs> you never know what to expect. But yeah, unfortunately, I do think that cedar count will spike a little bit as we get into the weekend. That higher concentration of the cedar trees off to the north of us should make a difference. Another warm and humid day tomorrow. Windy and cooler Saturday. The coolest temperatures yet as we get on into Sunday morning. You look at our high temperatures today. And we were well into the 70s and even 80s. So 78 San Antonio, 88 Carrizo Springs, Del Rio, 80 degrees, Pleasanton, 87. So we felt the warmth out there today, very spring-like. And, you know, I think tomorrow's going to be similar, but even a few degrees warmer in many instances. Outside, currently, we're at 72 degrees, dew point of 65. So we're feeling the humidity in the air, and it's going to stick around through tomorrow. 69 Rio Medina and Bulverde, comfort at 70 and Stinson, 75 degrees. Stinson did make it into the 80s uh, earlier today. Big picture across our area, just 60s and 70s now. Catula at 83 degrees, but at Laredo 81, those are the warmer exceptions. So tomorrow morning, not a big temperature drop. 
I mean, we're talking mid 60s along I 35 and even in and around San Antonio, just a little bit cooler, closer to 60 as you get along the Rio Grande, well into the 60s along the Gulf Coastline. So mid 60s for most of us to start the day. Then by the afternoon, should we get rid of the fog at a decent hour, you know, say by noon or one o'clock, I think we'll boost into the lower 80s in town. But farther west along the Rio Grande, upper 80s wouldn't even shock me if we hit 90 degrees in some locations along the Rio Grande. So we're thinking 84 Pleasanton, 80 in Canyon Lake, about 82 Stone Oak, Castroville 84, up to 86 in Elmendorf and Von Army. So a bit of a difference here, north to south across Bear County and surrounding communities. But high temperatures are gonna take a dive this weekend. Sure, we'll be in the 80s tomorrow, but by Saturday, near 60 pretty much all day long. Sunday, lower 60s for the high temperature, and then we rebound quickly into next week. And oh, despite this little temperature drop this weekend, by and large, the next week or two weeks is likely to be well above average temperature wise average being in the mid 60s for high temperatures in the afternoon. Mostly we're going to be above that for at least a week or two. Here's a look at the satellite and radar activity off to the west of us. This is good moisture for some of the western states and parts of the Rocky Mountains. They need it. This is going to move eastward and help push the cold front through our neck of the woods in the pre dawn hours on Saturday. Provide us with the slightest chance of rain, but unfortunately no good drought impacting or drought denting rainfall. Most of the state now considered in drought, 55% of Texas in drought now, according to the latest drought monitor issued, of course, every Thursday. And for us, that's mainly locations west of Highway 281 and especially closer to the Rio Grande, where we have most of our drought. Rain chances, just a little bit of drizzle tomorrow morning, 10% chance again tomorrow night with that cold front, and then 20% chance by Tuesday and Wednesday next week. So pretty bleak in terms of the needed rainfall. Fog and drizzle tomorrow morning. Anticipate the reduced visibility again in that overall dampness, but not adding up to anything. And then a little bit of sunshine back in the low 80s, mid 80s in some spots tomorrow afternoon. The humidity is gone by the weekend, so you're not going to notice the humidity. It's going to be fall like for two days. That will be Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, though, gusty. We're talking winds up to 45 miles per hour at times. Some brief gusts that high and temperatures near 60 most of the day. Then Sunday morning down into the mid 30s. We're predicting 35. That would be the coldest reading yet this season and even the chance of the first freeze in some outlying areas. We'll keep you updated on those details. Yeah, <laughs> Thursdays. I always got to look forward to it, though. My thermometer Thursday was more like a thermometer Wednesday leading into thermometer Thursday. Uh, take a peek. I had, a, I had the rare opportunity, had some time to go visit the kids at Vineyard Ranch Elementary School, part of NEISD. And that was just yesterday. Chatted with the second graders and thought it only appropriate being they the Broncos brought them a boot shaped thermometer to go with the theme of their mascot, the Broncos at Vineyard Ranch. So thanks to the second graders and everybody there for having me. Good time, good questions. And by the way, I announced the winners already today because I give away two ornaments per day, so I don't have another winner for you. Two ornaments per day. They're announced during the commercial breaks, kind of wedged in there at five and six. You can go to kset.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. For that the thermometer's kicking it. It's kicking it good. I do love those boot ones. Those are pretty cool. Thermometer's meant for walking. That's just what it'll do. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. Nicely done, Adam. Yeah. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, December 9th. Top stories are falling today. Police have little information to go on regarding a shooting just west of downtown. Officers got a call for a shooting around 11 last night in the 900 block of South Rio, and they found a man shot in the hand. Now, witnesses believe this stemmed from an argument in the parking lot of the Vista Verde Apartments, but police say the victim isn't telling them much about what happened. The man was taken to hospital for his injuries, but is expected to be okay. Body found over the weekend now identified as a student from Southwest High School. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is 18 year old Anthony Xavier Luna's body found on Kearney Road. That discovery made on Saturday, but the Sheriff's Office's Luna was last seen back on August 27th when someone in a black car picked him up from Southwest High School. 
More American teens will soon be better protected against COVID-19. Both the FDA and CDC now authorizing Pfizer's booster shot for 16 and 17 year olds. Early data suggesting getting a third shot appears to stand up against Omicron. The weather expected to take a deep dive this weekend as temperatures get cooler. Christian Assistance Ministry, or CAM, wants to help those experiencing homelessness in the process. That's why this morning they held a winter resource fair to get food, warm blankets, and clothing in the hands of those who need it most. Don White Fostick with the CAM organization says bringing these resources to those who need it goes much further than waiting for people to reach out for help. That's all our time. Thanks for watching the news at six. Spurs Nuggets at 730. We'll have highlights and much more coming up on the night beat at 10.